Morning guys. It's uh, Sunday morning, uh, very early, um, so we have to talk very quiet because Kate's still sleeping. But um, we're going to try something different over the next couple of days. You know, I'm not a big fan of the whole vlogging thing, but um, we're going to try it. If you like it, we'll do more of it. If you don't like it, you'll probably never see it on the channel again because this is all about you guys and, and where you see and perceive uh, value. But um, what started me wanting to do this was basically a lot of the comments that you guys email in to me revolve around, where are you? What are you doing? What are you up to? How do you make these videos so great? Which is why I opened up the Facebook page to give you guys a little bit of a peek behind the scenes. Well, over the next 48 hours, I'm going to take you along with me so that you can see what goes on behind the scenes and what goes into the videos so that, um, you know, I can just bring you closer to the process and hopefully put together something that you like. But what I'm basically going to be doing over the next couple of days is fine-tuning gear and fine-tuning process, which I'm always, do, always doing gears like the equipment, the, the tripods, the cameras, you know, these kinds of things. Process is how I utilize the gear to bring it all together to bring you guys a nice YouTube video. And if you've been a longtime subscriber of the channel, you'll know that I'm a huge proponent of using ballistic gelatin and air guns together because ballistic gelatin is such a great tool because it tells us, which is especially important with an air gun because they tend to be not as powerful, right? Let's all face it and man up to that, but and woman up to that. <clears throat> but ballistic gelatin is great for telling us how far and how effective. And I want to continue doing that in the videos but I need to improve that process because uh, ballistic gelatin, those segments in the video aren't shot in the same high definition uh, resolution that the rest of the video is shot. So it doesn't look as great on YouTube. And hold on a second. And so this, when we talk about gear, this is a Casio EXZR. 800 and this has been an excellent piece of equipment for me here on the channel except that now it's starting to become Actually, I shouldn't say starting it's been dated for a little while as far as what cameras have the ability to um, To capture and produce this is a great camera. This is a great video camera But there are our cameras now that are less expensive and more evolved that can accomplish more than this but but basically if you've ever watched one of my videos and you've seen a ballistic gelatin scene it's been filmed with this if you recall when I refill recharge an air gun and there's the little picture of the gauge on the, the the fill source itself and I usually put it up in a corner of the video for you guys to watch as the pressure comes up on the gauge on the gun itself that is also filmed with this and it's it's been a great tool for that what makes this especially good for um, ballistic gelatin is this is a high-speed camera What that means is the typical video is shot in 30 frames per second. Like, you know, when people are just walking around doing their thing or we're talking like this, this is 30 frames per second. The problem is if you try to shoot a block of ballistic gelatin at 30 frames per second, there's not enough data in there to capture like the expanding of the gel and the pellet spirals and these kinds of things. So you can take a camera like this and you can crank up the speed to 120 frames or 240 frames per second. Now, um, different YouTubers use different speeds. When you watch my videos, I shoot my ballistic gelatin scenes at 120 frames per second with this. The reason I use 120 over 240 is because the higher you go in speed, 240 frames per second, you're packing a lot more information in, in, a, in a segment of film than you are 120 or 30. The resolution goes away. For example, we are shooting 30 frames per second in 1920 by 1080 right now. This is high definition. <clears throat> when I break this out and I shoot a block of ballistic gelatin at 120 frames per second, we're at like 640 by 480 for resolution. And that's bad. That's like half. That's like less than half. 
And so what happens is you get that block of gel on your, on your uh, TV or computer monitor at home and, it, and it's kind of grainy. And that's not good for two reasons. One, it looks like crap, but two, it, it causes me to have to spend a lot more time in post, which is post is what we call the editing process, making that look better so it matches the quality of video of the rest of the video. Um, like I said, this also shoots in 240 frames per second, which slows things down even more, but there's a couple of caveats shooting in 240 frames per second. As you increase the frame rate, you need more light. So if it's a cloudy day, if the sun's low in the sky, or if you're in the shade, this just isn't going to do well. It's going to give you a very grainy picture. For example, at 240 frames per second, this shoots at 512 by 384 resolution. And when you compare that to 1920 by 1080, it's, it just looks very grainy, which is why you, you'll see guys on YouTube um, and their slow motion scope cam videos, which is very cool because you can see the pellet traveling. Um, the resolution is just poo. It's very, it's very grainy and pixelated, and that's why it doesn't look as nice <clears throat> as the rest of the video. So... And you guys will have to... Excuse me for being so disorganized today. My house is in complete chaos. Kate and I are redoing the house. We're redoing a bathroom. It's being totally gutted and redone. Um, and we're redoing my office, which is going to be really cool for the channel because we're basically building a kitchen in the office. It's going to look like a studio um, with a nice big um, countertops, you know, 90 degree countertops and all the cabinets and all the storage so that we have a professional place where I can do this one-on-one -on -one time with you guys if, if you wind up liking it rather than sitting at my dining room table, which is literally where I am right now. My garage is right there. My kitchen is right there. My front door and family room is right there. My front yard is out there. So this is not an ideal place to be shooting, which is why I'm up so early on Sunday because Kate's sleeping and she'll be sleeping till probably 10, 30, 11. So we've got a little bit of time, <clears throat> but that's why I'm running all over the place. So I apologize for that. So speaking of evolving equipment and that Casio becoming a little bit dated, this is called a GoPro. I think everybody on planet Earth knows what a GoPro is. And these are phenomenal cameras. They're spendy. This is the Hero 4 Black, which has been a $450 to $500 camera over the last couple of years. Um, but having GoPro since released the Hero 5 Black, like about a month ago, these are plummeting in price. Um, these are currently on BH Photo for $349 shipped. And just to let you know what an incredibly powerful and effective and superb camera these actually are, the Air Guns of Arizona Extreme Benchrest 2016 video that just came back from Phoenix, just put it up for you guys, the long one, the 14 minute one. Like a third of that video was shot with this right here. And if you like the quality of that video, you can see just what an excellent lens this is, what a great processor this is. So this is just a phenomenal camera. The reason this is a better choice than this for filming things like ballistic gelatin going forward on our channel is this also shoots at 120 frames per second and it also shoots at 240 frames per second. However, unlike this, this shoots 120 frames per second in full HD, 1920 by 1080, as opposed to the Casio, which shoots it at uh, like 6, 640 by 480. So way better resolution. This will also slow footage down to 240 frames per second, and it shoots 240 frames per second at 720p, which is like 1280 by 720, which is vastly better than the, than the 512 by 384 at 240 frames per second that this shoots. What all that rambling basically means is I can shoot with this at the same frame rate as this, but I can do it in high definition. And what that's going to mean to you guys is now the ballistic gelatin scenes, hopefully, we'll find out tomorrow, will um, match the quality of the rest of the video. So now when we see the pellet hit, we see that initial impact, and we see the spiraling and the wound cavity and all these cool things that we dig as air gunners, we'll be able to see them hopefully 
in much higher resolution. The reason I say hopefully is I've never done it before. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna step over to the kitchen. I'm gonna show you guys how I make my ballistic gelatin, give you a couple secrets as to getting it to come out so well without having to spend vast amounts of money for the clear gel that you see, see on the market. And, um, and then we're gonna let that set and prep overnight. And then we're gonna make sure that it's calibrated and then tomorrow I'm gonna to take you with me and we're going to uh, run some tests to see how well this does. I have very high hopes that it's gonna improve greatly upon this and, um, and we'll go from there. So this is our very first video vlog. Hopefully you enjoy coming with me, uh, coming along with me for the next couple of days. And like I said, if you liked this, give us a thumbs up and I'll know to do more of them and write something in the comment section. If you thought it was a complete waste of time, Give it a thumbs down and let me know why you didn't like it, please, in the comment section. It's always good to have that constructive feedback with this so I know what to change to fine tune the product to make it nicer for you guys. So with that, let's get over to the kitchen and I will show you how I make ballistic gelatin. Ballistic gelatin. Traditionally, when I first got started, I used this. This is Knox powdered gelatin. It's um, relatively inexpensive. It's $10 or so a pound on Amazon. Um, it works very well as far as uh, being able to calibrate it. It works very well as far as naturally um, and very closely simulating a tissue or flesh. The challenge with it and the reason it's a little bit less expensive is because it comes out amber in color. Even if you do a perfect job in preparing it, it, it comes out a little bit amber which is not so great because you can't see what's going on as well in there when, when we make videos with this stuff. This is what I've been using for quite some time now. This is uh, made by Custom, uh, Custom Collagen. It's also um, powdered gelatin so it's the same organic material that works very well for simulating these things except um, it's called super clear it's more expensive it's like fifteen dollars a pound as opposed to ten dollars a pound again on amazon shipped but it is much much better and they're both very easy to work with if you follow some very specific instructions which i'm about to share with you ballistic gelatin the calibration process Long time ago, a, a, a branch of the United States federal government called the M, uh, INS, Immunization and Naturalization Service, um, came up with a formula. The formula was basically this. They, they used a ratio of one part um, powdered gelatin to nine parts water, so one to nine. And you basically, from that, get a 10% ballistic gelatin mixture. You hear it called a 10% mixture. Okay. Now, it's very important that the mixture be calibrated and fine-tuned because based on your cooking temperature, how fast you warm it, um, how cold you chill it in your fridge, your calibration results will vary greatly. A couple of hard rules. Never exceed 104 degrees when you're preparing the gelatin and we'll get more into that and also when you're chilling the gelatin you want to chill it down to 37 38 39 degrees somewhere in there in in your fridge and you're going to want to be specific about this because just a five or ten degree swing <clears throat> in in the temperature of the gelatin once it's prepared will change your calibration process when you go to make sure that it is true to life so what is this calibration process well ins came up with this. If you shoot a steel BB into the gelatin from a distance of 10 feet away at 600 feet per second, plus or minus 10 feet per second, that BB needs to penetrate somewhere between three and one quarter inches and three and three quarter inches. If it does that successfully, then you've accomplished a gelatin that is quote unquote calibrated and will give you true to life um, results. 
So, what are you going to need? Well, you're going to need preferably some of this if you're comfortable with the price. If not, this works just as well. It's just more amber than this. Okay. You're going to need um, cinnamon oil, pure cinnamon oil. I get this on Amazon. It works great. You need very little of it. So a bottle, probably one-fifth this size, and this is a um, four-ounce bottle, will probably last you for the rest of your life. So don't go crazy on this stuff. Okay? You need a good, reliable digital thermometer because temperature is crucial to being able to get the gel properly calibrated. If you make it too warm or too warm too quickly, your results are going to be all over the place and it's not going to be true to life. You need a suitable container, uh, preferably plastic with very slick sides. Here in Tampa Bay, we have a store called the Container Store and that's where I buy this one. It is a three liter, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, this is a three liter container, which for me, a couple of these lined up in a row is what you'll see in most of the videos except for the series of big board videos that are coming up in which I have these bigger because these just aren't going to cut it. These would probably explode. But um, So you'll need a suitable container, two of these for the typical 177, 22, 25, even a 30 cal. All these guns shooting at 8, 900, 1,000 feet per second. Two of these when calibrated, calibrated properly is all, <clears throat> all you're going to need. You're going to need some kind of no-stick spray. Um, I like to use this Pam Superior no-stick olive oil. It works very well to coat this so the gelatin block doesn't stick in here when we're trying to remove it. You're also going to need a big ass pot. I don't know how big this one is. It doesn't say, but it's basically the biggest one I could find at, at Target and it works great for cooking gelatin. You also need a wooden spoon. And outside of, that, this, outside of this, this is everything you're going to need to make nice gelatin for yourself. So I'm going to get all this shifted over to the, to the stove area, and um, we're going to get started. I'm going to show you how to make it. So like we talked about, this is a three liter container and we are going to prepare two of these. So what I need to do is take cold water, the coldest water I can get my hands on. If you for some reason live in a really warm climate like I do in the summertime and your water comes out of the tap at like 80 degrees, which is the way it is here in Florida in the summer, it's not now because it's you know end of October and we're cooling down. It's okay to use ice to get this water cold because you want this as cold as you possibly can and it'll mix much better with the gelatin. So I'm going to fill this up two times and I'm going to put these two tubs of water in our cooking pot. It's important to be precise so I'm going to stop right at three liters. Perfect. So in it goes. Do one more. Now remember, we're trying to match gelatin at a rate of one to nine, which will give you about the 10 or 11 percent that the INS calls for. However, again, if you live in a very warm place like Florida, what will happen is you'll you'll get this stuff mixed, you'll get it chilled. And then you'll take it out into the field and even though you bring it into the field in an ice chest filled with ice, you'll take that block of gel and you'll set it out on your table to shoot whatever and the sun will begin to warm it very quickly. An important part of the calibration process is that this stays at around 39 degrees. Well, that's just not gonna happen here in, in Central Florida. So what I'll typically do is I'll chill this overnight down to about 35 degrees put it in the ice chest, put it out in the sun, and then hopefully it's around 39 degrees, but it normally isn't. So what I tend to do, I've had much better luck mixing my gelatin at a ratio of one part powdered gelatin to seven parts water, which gives me about 14% um, overall density of, of the gelatin. So for each one of these, we're going to need 14 and a half 
14 and a half ounces over on this side, 14 and a half ounces of powdered gelatin to each three ounces, three liters, excuse me, of water. So let's get things moved over to the stove and we'll get started. So 14 and a half by two is about 29, right? And you want to be as precise as you can with this stuff so that you, after all your hard work, your calibrations come out the way you want them to. I'll get the water kind of stirring in a circle like this, and then I'll slowly start to add the gelatin. The kind of key here is just to break the surface temp tension so the gelatin gets pulled in the water. And you want to do this relatively quickly because what will happen is the gelatin, the longer it sits in the water, will begin to what is called hydrate itself. And that's a fancy term for the gelatin powder will begin to absorb the water. And this will move from like a watery consistency to like a, uh, basically like a maple syrup consistency and it becomes hard to, hard to stir. Don't worry about the bubbles. Um, there's easy ways to get all that out and I'll show you how to do that later on. Again, the key here is breaking the surface tension so you don't get clumps of, of uh, collagen or gelatin near the surface and just keep it moving. By the way, this stuff is sticky. So clean up good after yourself and try not to get it anywhere because it's, it's worse than maple syrup. And your wife is going to kill you if she's got little sticky spots all over her kitchen. Notice again I'm doing this quickly. So if I take my time here, I'll have a big problem, big problem on my hands as far as the stuff getting too thick before I get it all mixed in. Alright, so I got it mixed in there and as you can see, there's no clumps. And that's what we want. We want a clump free water base here. Just going to kind of keep mixing it. Now what you'll notice is up around the um, circumference of the, the pot is powdered gelatin and we don't want that to fall into our mixture once it warms and clears. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a plastic spatula like this, dunk it in the gelatin to get it wet, and just get all that stuff off, off the side. Off the sides of the pot. That's important before you go too much further. Because if those pieces fall into your clear gelatin, they'll be cloudy and clumpy and you're not going to be happy with the results. Okay. Get yourself a paper towel, like this one, to lay your utensils down on. Because I'm telling you guys, I know I said it I think two times already, this stuff is crazy sticky and crazy messy. Okay. Got a little bit of it on the spatula here. I'm going to get that off too. Okay. Now what's happening right now while we're mixing this stuff, I've applied no heat yet. Um, is the gelatin is hydrating so like we said it's absorbing the uh, the water and it's getting quite a bit thicker now I usually like to mix this and let it hydrate I don't know for somewhere around five or ten minutes to make sure that it's I just splashed myself to make sure that it's good and, and soaked up before I start applying any heat so while I'm mixing this let's talk a little bit about heat so the INS has made it very clear that if you don't heat properly, you can ruin the ballistic correctness of the final product. You'll jade it and it just won't be right. So a couple of things they've told us. One, never heat this to over 104 degrees, okay? So if I've got a thermometer, right, and I stick it in here, and it says like 98 degrees or 95 or 80 or whatever, okay, and I'm not constantly stirring this, constantly stirring this, as in never take a break ever for the whole time that we do this, 
once we start applying heat, the temperature down here will be much warmer than it is up here. This could be 107, 108, 110, even on low. This could be 120, 130 degrees down here if you're not constantly moving it, and that will destroy your mixture as far as the correctness, and it will also make it cloudy. So one of the secrets to super clear gelatin is super slow heating. Okay, you'll notice this consistency in the GoPro is, uh, is starting to really thicken up, which is what we want. And if we wait a few more minutes, it'll get even thicker. Now once I get the consistency in here to where like my forearm starts cramping a little because it's getting so heavy, I'll start to apply heat. Alright, so I've got that pretty well mixed up. I'm going to get all of the slop off of here that I can. Even though I'm putting this on a paper towel, this stuff is so dang messy. It's so sticky, okay? And I'm just gonna let that sit for, like I said, five or 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll start applying heat, and um, I'll give you some more pointers. Okay, so, We've let this sit about 10 minutes, and as you can see, it's got a pretty gelatinous consistency to it. It's still crystalline in water, so don't worry if, uh, if you see the crystals in there. That's just fine. But now we're to the point where the powdered gelatin has absorbed about as much water as it's going to. And so we're going to start to apply heat. Now, my burner goes from basically zero to six. I'm gonna start this out at three, just for about the first, I don't know, two, three minutes or so. Constantly moving, just to get the pan itself warmed up. And I'm gonna continue stirring, because the bottom of the pan here is definitely going to exceed 140 degrees, and I don't wanna burn or get that mixture over 104. Expect this whole process beginning to end to take about 45 minutes to an hour. It's a little labor intensive. <laughs> but if you love air guns and you love teaching and you love making movies, then um, it's just fine. And about three minutes in is when I'm going to start monitoring my temperature. And you'll notice just after about three minutes, at about medium heat, our temperatures come up to about 82 degrees. So now I'm going to back this down to two, right? And I'm going to leave it there through the entire process until the very end, continually mixing this. Temperature's still coming up. We're up around 92 degrees now. Okay, there's 99. All right, so we just hit 100, so I'm going to take this down to low. In the last couple minutes here, I'm going to heat it really slowly. Okay, here we are at about 103 and a half. So we're going to kill the heat so we don't accidentally ruin this batch. And there's 104. So as soon as I remove or hit 104, I'll remove it and continue to stir it because the bottom of that pan is, uh, is hot. Alright, when you get your gelatin mix off the stove, the top layer of it may be completely foamed over in a light layer of um, bubbles. If you use the Knox gelatin, it's going to be foamier. If you use the custom collagen gelatin, it's going to be less foamy. But if you see the, the white layer of froth over the top, don't panic, okay? That's where our cinnamon oil comes into place.
Okay, I use one drop per three liters. So there's six liters of water in here. So it's going to be one, two. That'll do two things for us. One, it's going to act as somewhat, a, a, um, somewhat of a preservative because this is an organic mixture. If you leave this outside of the refrigerator, or as soon as you start bringing it outside, just like mayonnaise, just like jello, just like you know, roasted turkey, whatever, it's going to begin to deteriorate, decompose, and um, it's gonna be a mess. So this helps combat that. This also helps with those bubbles, and it makes it smell great. And in time, what you'll see is that those bubbles will go away. Now you'll notice I'm mixing it. And in the short time that I've put the two drops of cinnamon oil in there and have been mixing it, they've almost completely gone away, okay? So that's good and mixed, so I'm going to let that sit up. And while it sits up for a couple of minutes, we're going to prepare our containers here. Now, the Pam olive oil is colored. It's the color of olive oil. It's like that greenish, amber, and so you don't want to use a ton of it because you'll color your mixture. So what I like to do is don't use regular paper towel because this will come off and wind up in here, and then when you pour this in there, it, it'll, it, it, you'll see, if you put a magnifying glass on it, you'll see the little bitty paper chunks, fibers floating around in there. So I like to use typical shop towels. These don't lint as much. I'll just tear one off, fold it in fours, give the Pam a good shake, once around like that is all you need, super, super sparing, and get the sides of this and the bottom of this really well coated. Do not go crazy with this stuff or your clear gel is going to turn back into amber gel and you're not going to be happy with the results. Okay? You're barely going to see it on here, but believe me, it's on there. And you just need a very, very little bit to get these, to, uh, get these blocks to pop out once they've set up. Okay, that one's done. Another little quick misting, and we'll go after the other one. All right, so these are ready to go. Clean up the workspace here a bit. So one at a time. I like to turn them this way, so when I pour, I have a greater surface area to pour into, less chances of a miss, actually. Put it over here and hopefully the GoPro will capture some of this for you guys. Oh, and you can see how clear that's looking already. You notice I'm pouring relatively slowly. It's because I don't want to put any more bubbles in here than I have to. If you do put bubbles into it, not the end of the world because they will eventually rise to the top because we're going to let this set before we put it into the fridge and uh, it'll be pretty bubble free after that. All right, so we got that one going. Hmm, smells like cinnamon jello. Not bad. All right. Let's give these a try. Now, if you haven't seen my other Jello Shop video, okay. And we want these pretty even because we're going to put one in front of the other so the pellet has a good distance to get trapped. If it goes out the back, it's not a huge deal, but you're not going to get realistic penetration measurements and you're not going to be able to recover the pellet, which is for me, half the fun. I just like looking at them. I like looking at the rifling marks on the pellets. I like looking at how they've expanded or how they haven't. All right, we put this in the sink. If you have bigger bubbles up here, like bubbles, uh, don't worry about it because this is going to be the bottom of the ballistic gel box. These will be blocks. These will be inverted. So don't sweat that. If you see a little foam up here, totally not a big deal again because it's the, it's the bottom. Now, got the little GoPro set up here, and what you will see, hopefully, by me shining this light over here, is that we are winding up with very, very clear 
gelatin. So when we pop it out of these molds, it's going to be something nice to look at. Now when you put the flashlight on it, you're going to see like a billion little bubbles inside of it. Not a big deal because we're going to let this sit here for a good hour before we move it over to the fridge and that will allow all these bubbles to, uh, to lift out of the mixture and then they won't mess up, uh, mess up our results tomorrow. All right, so it's 11 o'clock. We're gonna come back at noon and, um, and we'll put them in the fridge and then they'll stay there overnight until tomorrow when we go shoot, which is just fine because my father-in-law is gonna be here any minute and we have to do some gardening together in the backyard and I have a pumpkin carving to go to this afternoon and then it'll be uh, early to bed because we need to be early to rise. To capture the very best footage, you want very good backlighting behind the gelatin. Um, so we're gonna need a sun that is low in the sky coming up behind the gelatin, but we'll get more into that uh, tomorrow. So in an hour, I'll see you again, and we'll get this stuff in the fridge, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about temperature when we do. Okay, so it's been an hour and we've given our gelatin ample time to have all those bubbles lift out of it so it's looking really good so now I'm going to move it to the fridge. Now we keep our fridge right at 39 degrees which is very ideal to match up with the calibration that INS recommends. However remember tomorrow I'm going to be taking these blocks of gel putting them in a cooler with ice and moving them one hour out into the country and I'm going to get this colder by one, colder by one, and we're going to leave it overnight. Okay, we got to move quick because it's already a quarter to nine and that sun is coming up very quickly. And like we talked about yesterday, we want that low in the sky so that there's a lighting source behind the blocks. So when the camera's over here, it can, it can see through and, um, and get a very good image. So um, what I've done is I've set up a cardboard box filled with rubberized mulch 50 yards down range. And I've got some adhesive uh, targets on it just to make sure that the uh, Marauder is uh, dialed in and shooting straight. And then once I feel like it is, we'll set up the blocks on that table, get the GoPro down there, get it into high speed mode, and, uh, and see what happens. About 2,000. Put some air in this bad boy.
Whew, okay. I've got the table and the chronograph pointed pointed kind of to the east here because these things don't like to pick up anything that's gold colored and it's a pain in the ass to get them to see a gold copper plated steel BB. And with the sun like this, it's going to be especially challenging. But I still think we can probably pull it off. All right. Get this gel set up, get it out of the cooler, take a test shot, make sure it's calibrated. And we'll go from there. Yeah, this stuff looks nice. Wanna pull on the sides and pops right out. Gotta love the olive oil. Sliding all over the place too. Okay. Make sure we got a decent line of sight here. I think we do. <sighs> Never leave home without it. <laughs> okay. Usually about seven pumps. Gets me right about to 600 feet per second. Of course, I want to make this a good show for you guys, so I'm hoping the crony can see this little bugger. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Who needs Bowflex? Hey, 611 feet per second, it picked it up. Nice and close. And penetration is right at three and three quarter inches. So that's perfect. You want to be three and a quarter to three and three quarter. That's a little soft. Maybe it got a little warm, but since this is on the high end of calibrated, I think that We'll get it back in the cooler here while we set up the camera because that's going to take probably 10 minutes and we don't want this to get mucked up. Then again, I guess if you think about it, if we're shooting at 611 feet per second on the crony and those uh, guidelines are plus or minus 10, it would make sense that we'd be on the high side of the threshold, but I don't know. just want to give you guys a realistic example here. All right, let's pack that back up. The critical step of aligning the crony with the target and the rifle and the camera. If you guys have watched my videos before and never wondered how I capture chronograph pictures, this is often how I do it. Sometimes I'll use that other Canon camera, but this Casio works pretty well. The trick is to zoom in all the way in on this so you don't see anything on the periphery and then the, then the exposure will be right and it'll stay focus locked for you. I've backed this back to three power Rolled the uh, AO back to 10 yards. We want to make sure we're lined up right in the middle of those bars coming off that chronograph. And the reticle is right in the middle of the table down there. Okay, that's awfully close. Just going to adjust this a little bit that way. All right, that's perfect. Turn this on so that the camera's got something to lock on to. Give this a test here. Zoom, zoom, zoom. I'll drop this down just a hair. Exposure looks really good. Focus looks really good. Just test locked it, no problem. All right, so that's all set up. 
right there. Good. So we'll turn this back off to conserve battery, turn off the chronograph to conserve battery, get down range and uh, set up the GoPro and the gelatin. That's where our camera is going to sit because our sun is directly behind the block. And when I bring the camera down here, it'll have all that beautiful backlighting to the east. And that's the key to getting a great slow motion shot. All right, these Hero 4 blacks don't have the LCD monitor in the back like the new 5. However, there's a GoPro app that allows you to connect it to your phone and your phone becomes your monitor. And that's how we set up these shots just right. Right now I'm just connecting to the camera with the app. The nice thing about the app too is I can control everything in the camera. You don't have to use these buttons. High speed, regular speed, time lapse, all that. Everything that can be adjusted here can be adjusted here. Great, so there's my picture. So we'll set that up just like so and get this down to the right level. All right, that's looking pretty good right there. A little closer. All right, now we got to get it in the right camera mode. And again, we'll use the app for that. Right now we're 1080i 30 frames per second. We're going to move this to 120 frames per second. And it's going to leave us at 1920 by 1080, which is full HD. And um, we'll shoot one polymag at 120 and 240, and then we'll shoot one H&N Barracuda at 120 and 240. There's not going to be a whole lot happening in the second block, so that's where we'll put the BB. And we'll focus the camera on this forward block, because that's where you'll see the majority of the action. What I'm going to do real quick, this field of view is really wide, and, and this is the first time I've experimented with this. So we're going to try it at a narrow field of view and see what that looks like. Because I'm like here to here, and, and you just don't need all that. Let's see what this looks like. Much better. Now I'm like here to here. And that's important. It's like zooming a camera, which concentrates the camera's ability to capture, to capture the shot you want. I'm going to show you what this looks like at home real quick. Let me just refocus here. I don't know how well you can see that. This lighting is poo. There we go. And exposure right there. There, that's what you're seeing. That's what the GoPro is seeing right now. Basically that first block end to end and then a little bit. What you want, a little bit of rumor on the perimeter because in slow motion, that block should bounce and wobble and jiggle and you want to be able to, to catch that. So let's get back there and get going before our gel gets any warmer. A little 100 yard jog there. First thing Monday morning. All right, this looks good. So I charged the gun off camera back up to uh, about 24, 23, 4, 23, 2400 PSI, and that should put us right in the sweet spot. <sighs> I get my breathing under control. <laughs> Boom. Direct hit. Let's look at the chronograph, made sure it picked up. It did. 
850.9. Whew, looks good. All right, so now we'll go down there and we'll change the frames per second on the GoPro from 120 to 240. Now remember, that's gonna drop our resolution, but it's gonna increase the amount of data compressed into that segment, so we should be able to see more. And now the GoPro is rolling at 240 frames per second. So let's hit it again. And when we get home, we will check it out. A son of a gun. I think that went through the exact same hole. <laughs> so these, this Gen 1 Marauder, mine loves polymags, even out to 100 yards. So let me pick a different aim spot here, just below it. Boom, good. That should be a good shot. All right, uh, let me think. Well, you know what, as long as we're rolling at 240, Let's switch right over to the Barracuda Hunters, which shot a little bit high. Excuse me, a little, what did they shoot? They shot a little bit high. So we're gonna roll right into these. They shot about half a dot high, which should make it land right about there. Good hit. All right, now I'm gonna run up there, change it back to 120 frames per second because then we'll have the polymag at 120 and 240. We've already got the H&N um, Barracuda Hunter at 240. Now we'll bring it back to 120, take our final shot and go home and check it out. 300 yards on a Monday morning before 10 o'clock. All right. All right, one last hit with the Barracuda Hunter at 50 yards and 120 frames per second. Son of a gun. That went through that same polymag hole. That polymag hole should have two polymags and a Barracuda Hunter in it. It's like a pellet magnet. Good hit, just to the left of it. Whoo, all right, that wraps this up. So I'll see you guys back at home once we uh, analyze the footage. It's only a couple days till Halloween. It is Wednesday about 4 o'clock. I just finished up the video editing. The reason I'm pointing over here is because that's where my computer monitor is. And we spent the better part of four days working on this project. So back to the questions you guys asked me, what are you doing? What are you up to? What's taking you so long? Just to put this video together has taken the better part of four days. We spent probably half a day Sunday, um, good part of the day, almost all the day Monday 
Monday late in the day, well into the evening, I got into the editing. Edited all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, up until now, I was up early, both Tuesday and Wednesday, trying to get this knocked out. And it winds up being about a day to a day and a half in production. And on a video like this, about 25 hours in editing. The very um, elaborate videos like you've seen, like the Extreme Bench Rest 2016 video, had almost 70 hours in editing in that one and probably four or five days in, in filming. So you can see how time consuming this, um, this can be. But um, some final thoughts, GoPro. Definitely holding on to this going forward for the ballistic gelatin scenes. Day and night difference for me. I'm sure you saw it too when we compared the gel hits in the beginning of the video to, to the, the hits at the end of the video using the GoPro. Uh, 240 versus 120. I'm probably going to stick with the 120. I did recognize and appreciate that in the 240 frames per second, it was capturing a little bit more data, more frames. Um, but the 120 came out fine. It captured the bulges, it captured the spirals, and it did it in full HD, 1920 by 1080 versus that 1280 by 720 in 240 frames per second. So now it'll all match the caliber of footage throughout the video, so I'm very pleased with that. Um, I know this isn't a ballistic gelatin pellet testing video, but if you look right there, <laughs> I put the pellets up for you guys to... Um, to check out the polymags, all three of them penetrated right at six inches, and the Barracuda Hunters, all three of them penetrated right at nine inches. So, air guns ain't for kids. These things will kill your ass at 50 yards and beyond. So, um, let's just all re remember that. So, with that, um, thank you. Look forward to seeing you guys again very soon. In fact, any day now, an RWS Diana Entech should be arriving, so we'll have a Springer review right back in the mix and then immediately following that we're going to have a series of big board videos and I am very excited to get started on all of that for you as that's going to be a, a very cool time. Don't forget thumbs up if you liked this style of vlog just hanging out with me for a couple of days. Thumbs down if you did it and and as to why and I'll try to make the adjustment to try to get as many of you excited and and um, feeling fulfilled as I as I can and um, with that thanks again and I'll see you again real soon.